Christian told me that the lectures have been organized um, by the collections from north to south in Italy. And since Hanover is very far in the north, it's also logical that I start the Congress. Oh, sorry, I need to do. Okay, for those who don't know where Hanover is located, you can see it uh, pretty far in the north of Germany. And Hanover is actually a city which is not at all doomed to have anything to do with Egyptology because there is no Egyptology at the University of Hanover, although one must say the most important sun of the city of Hanover is uh, Leibniz. And Leibniz was the first one to suggest to um, uh, um, uh, Louis XIV, so um, uh, um, Ludwig XIV of France, to do an Egyptian invasion, which he didn't do, but on the basis of what Leibniz suggested to um, Louis XIV, um, uh, it was later Napoleon who went to Egypt on this recommendation of Leibniz, and this is, as we all know, the real start of the science of Egyptology. So, however, if you look at the map and where is located the letter A of Hanover, there is still a very important Egyptian monument. It is a pyramid. And this is the oldest pyramid built in modern times. So you, all of you know the Cestius Pyramid in Rome. And between the Cestius Pyramid in Rome and this pyramid, no pyramid was ever built in the entire world. This dates from of 1630. And it's a memorial to um, um, one, one of the generals of the 30-year war because there was a very important battle at the city of Seelze, close to Hanover. So if we now move to the southeast of Hanover, we have yet another pyramid. This one is built by the most famous architect of Hanover. He also built the Opera House in Hanover. His name is Lavis, and he built this pyramid um, for as a cemetery for um, a Duke of Münster. And then in the southwest of Hanover, you find yet a third pyramid. This is a pyramid also built as a cemetery, as a grave for um, one of the dukes of the area um, on the river Weser. So if we look closer to where Hanover is located, and you combine, actually, the pyramid in the northwest, in the southeast, and in the southwest, what do you have? You have a pyramid. And this pyramid, this triangle on the map, will actually include two cities, which is the city of Hanover, and as you see in the south, there is the city of Hildesheim. And it happens that the two cities of Hanover and Hildesheim house two important Egyptian collections. Actually, if you would reunite them, and actually it's, it's very close, it's just half an hour on the train, the distance, you actually have the most important Egyptian collection in Germany after Berlin. But that's not difficult because Berlin is always the biggest and greatest and everything. So, however, Hanover and Hildesheim has two important collections. Until 2008, we were called Kestner Museum in Hanover, and it was in 2008 that we changed our name to Museum August, Kest August Kestner. This was mainly to honor the founding father of the museum, who is uh, August Kestner, whom you see in a portrait here. He lived from 1777 till 1853. And he is the fourth, actually, of 12 children of this lady. Her name is Charlotte Buff. Um, when 
that's her maiden name. She then came, became Charlotte Kestner, and um, she is very famous in German and world literature because she was a youth friend of Johann Wolfgang Goethe, you know, the famous German writer. And he met uh, Charlotte Buff when he was doing an internship at um, um, a, a court in Wetzlar, where she is from, and he fell madly in love with her. But unfortunately, she um, was already promising her mother that she would marry a guy named Kestner from Hanover because he had already um, a good job. And the young Goethe, unfortunately, was just at the beginning of his career. So this frustration of love, in my opinion, is the greatest blessing of world literature because Goethe published his first successful book, which is Die Leiden des Jungen Werther, of which I just learned, I Dolori di Giovanna Werther, <laughs> in Italian. And um, it uh, became an absolute success. And in this book, uh, Goethe immortalized uh, Charlotte Buff uh, by the um, character of Lotte. And you all, those who have read the book know that um, uh, she is a very good character, but her future husband is not. And for the family in Hanover, this was partly a blessing, but partly it was also uh, uh, doomed. So there we have a nice illustration to the book. Actually, Lotte is buried very close to our museum in a, on a cemetery in Hanover. And by the way, if most of you may not know that um, Lotte became again a major character of a piece of world literature, which is a book um, by uh, Thomas Mann, Lotte in Weimar. And this novel uh, tells <coughs> the story, which is true, that after 40 years that they met in Wetzlar, and um, the husband of Lotte was already dead for some years, uh, she went to Weimar to meet the old Goethe. And she spent two weeks with him <coughs> in Weimar, and this is the story of the novel of um, uh, Thomas Mann. So um, her fourth son was August Kestner, this is a portrait when he was young. He studied um, um, uh, law at the University of Göttingen, and um, soon after finishing studying, he did a trip to Italy. Where else, you know? <laughs> and he madly fell in love with the city of Rome. So this is actually a self-portrait. He was a very... Um, um, good uh, 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 draftsman himself, so he did a lot of portraits. You will see more of him. And um, so he, um, after this trip, he longed very much to go back to Rome as soon as possible. And this occasion arised when um, uh, after the uh, Cong Vienna Congress in 1815, you know, when the uh, landscape of Europe was redesigned after the Napoleonic Wars, um, uh, the, what used to be the um, um, uh, elector state of Hanover became a kingdom of Hanover, and it included suddenly um, a lot of um, minorities, Catholic minorities, because the land, um, the Kingdom of Hanover, is purely Protestant, but it now it became much bigger than before, and it included uh, Catholic minorities. So um, the King of Hanover had to send a delegation to the Pope of Rome to negotiate a concordat. So Kestner was the secretary of this delegation. 
Um, I guess very much to his joy, the negotiations with the Pope did not went very well and took seven years. So, um, and after this, even there was no concordat, there was just an agreement. So, um, by the way, the, the director of the delegation died during these seven years, and Kestner had then the wonderful idea to make himself ambassador of the kingdom of Hanover in Rome. And that's the reason why he lived in Rome until the end of his life in 1853, which is in the end 37 years. And you can see that very well on the portrait because you can see the dome of St. Peter's in Rome at the back of this uh, painting. So um, he, but by becoming the ambassador of the kingdom of Hanover in Rome, he also became the ambassador of some other small minor country, which is called Great Britain. <laughs> because at this time, Great Britain and Hanover were ruled by the same king, which you may know started with George I, that the Hanover line of the kings of England started. So um, I guess he was very busy in Rome as an ambassador because there were many more uh, English tourists coming to Rome at that time of which he had to take care than German tourists or even people from Hanover. So he was very busy, but still he had a lot of time because he, uh, with some German uh, archaeological friends, he had the leisure to, for example, excavate um, in Etruscan cities. And he did excavations in Chavetri, he did excavations in Tarquina, and the, in Tarquina there's even a, an Etruscan tomb which is called after Kestner, although the name Kestner is always dropped because this is La Tumba del Barone, and it should actually be La Tumba del Barone Kestner, but Kestner is always dropped. It's apparently this German name is too complicated. But in any case, um, he was very much interested, as you see, in arts and archaeology, and he was particularly interested in the new science and development of Egyptology. So um, he met in Rome twice this gentleman whom he portrait. It's a portrait by Kestner again. It's, um, the, um, uh, it's Jean-Francois Champollion. And um, the second time he met him was in uh, 1826. And there Kestner was present when Champollion had to defend his decipherment of hieroglyphs against a German professor of Orientalistic Studies from Leipzig who suggested a different translation of the hieroglyphs. And then Kestner was present when they had a scientific dispute in front of the corps diplomatique uh, in Rome. And he writes back a letter saying, oh, how much I would have um, w uh, wished it for my compatriot, the German, but I must insist and I must confess the crown of decipherment of hieroglyphs bears the Frenchman. <laughs> so he already uh, understood that the correct system was by Champollion and he actually learned hieroglyphs by Champollion, from Champollion himself. Ten years later, 12 years later, he met this gentleman in Rome, again a portrait by Kestner, which is Karl Richard Lepsius. And he was um, coming to Rome um, for um, being um, the secretary of an institution, the first archaeological institution of the world, which was founded in 1828 by 
among other people, Kestner, which was the Instituto di Correspondenza Archeologica, um, which is a forerunner institution of the German Archaeological Institute, which since 1909 has also a famous branch in Cairo. So you see he was very much interested in Egyptology and he started to build up a collection. And I know that he went regularly from Rome to Livorno because um, this is where all the big Egyptian collections arrived after they have been assembled in, um, in Egypt. They all came through the port of Livorno, they came to um, uh, Europe. And the only object I know where it comes from is this one at my museum. It's a little um, uh, plaque in form of a shield and um, I only know it because there are five more of a series of six in the Louvre in Paris. And that was the first collection which came um, to France uh, of which later then Champollion became the director and it entered the Louvre. So five are in the Louvre, one is in Hanover. I have no idea how Kestner got that one, but I'm sure it was supposed to end up in Paris, but it's now in Hanover. Kestner lived all of his life in the uh, Via Gregoriana in Rome, um, in the Palazzo Tomati. Uh, for those who don't know where Via Gregoriana is, it's up the Spanish stairs and then to the right, very easy. And then on the left side is the Palazzo Tomati. And there he, chain, uh, he, he, um, uh, had the f he lived on the first floor and put up also parts of his collection. And on the downstairs floor, most of the time he lived uh, Bertel Thorvaldsen, the famous Danish sculptor. And again, a portrait by Kestner of 1809 and one of uh, 18 um, uh, something. <laughs> um, Thorvaldsen later in 1842 moved back to Copenhagen and a museum has been built for him in which in, which in the courtyard Thorvaldsen is even buried. And it is really interesting to compare because Kestner in one publication says that his only rival in acquiring Egyptian art in Rome was Bertel Thorvaldsen. And when the, his collection from Rome moved to Copenhagen, the city of Copenhagen not only built the museum, but the city decided to freeze the collection in exactly the way it came. So it's the original Thorvaldsen collection. And that one has 441 Egyptian objects. Uh, in uh, comparison, the collection of Kestner, which you see here in his Salona in Palazzo Tomati, um, came to Hanover, but the city of Hanover decided to enlarge the collection. So we have continued collecting Egyptian art, which Copenhagen didn't. Kestner was very much in fond of his Egyptian collection, but as you see, he also collected paintings. He himself thought that his most important painting would be the one above his own sculpted portrait, this one, because he thought it was a Raphael, Raffaello. However, his most important painting is this one, which is until now the only painting of the artist which you would find in a public collection in Germany at the Landesgalerie in Hanover. It's a painting by the Florentine Manares painter Pontormo. So it's the only painting of Pontormo you would find in a public collection in Germany. And then down here you can see part of his Egyptian collection. He wrote an inventory himself, but only of the Egyptian collection, 
so he was very proud of it. And um, so we have this inventory, luckily. Um, and when Kestner died in 1853, he knew that he would be buried next to an Egyptian monument, which I think he was very happy about, because the Cemiterio Acatolico, next to the Pyramid of Cestius, was a foundation by Kestner and other Protestants living in Rome. So this is where you find his tomb, and you also find the tomb because Kestner, during his lifetime, unfortunately, he had the very sad task of burying the only son of the friend of his mother, Goethe, which is, um, you, you, you see, he even doesn't bear his own name. He's just the Goethe Filius, but his name is August von Goethe, and actually when he was born, Goethe named him after August Kestner. So you see how close the relations between Kestner and the Goethe, uh, and Goethe was. So this is his tomb, and you have a beautiful portrait by Torvaldsen of Kestner, and um, by the way, as you see, he always looked very skinny and um, the ambassador of Austria in Rome, uh, when he met Kestner in Rome, he um, wrote back to his wife saying, you know whom I met here in Rome? It's the son of Lotte from Goethe's Werther. And um, uh, you know, he has a funny name here in Rome. He's always called um, uh, Werther's Leiden. So, idolori de verta. <laughs> so, and you see the inscription on his tomb is in English, and that's the reason why, uh, because he was um, ambassador of the kingdom of Great Britain. So, on his death, and actually we are lucky to have these uh, documentations of his collection, they were done in 1853 by a grandnephew of Kestner. So we know exactly how his collection was displayed. And um, uh, um, the family got authorization from the Pope to uh, bring the entire collection to Hanover, to Germany, because uh, Kestner, uh, in his testament, he bequested the collection to his nephew, Hermann Kestner, again a portrait uh, August Kestner did of his nephew. Um, he looked differently in a photograph, and um, he, uh, in the testament, it said that if Hermann Kestner succeeded, that the city of Hanover would build a museum for the collection, then the whole collection would be given to the city of Hanover. And the city of Hanover did, and uh, built this museum, the first municipal museum in Hanover, um, which opened its doors in 1889. And I think at that time, all the Egyptian objects, you can see it here as well, were on display. This is an old photo of the painting gallery, and the paintings we don't have anymore. We've been given to the Landes Gallery in Hanover but you can see how the museum was displayed. Unfortunately, no photo of the Egyptian collection, but um, I think um, there were approximately between 800 and 1,000 Egyptian objects to be seen at this museum in 1889, and that was the biggest Egyptian collection on display in Germany, again after Berlin, because Berlin had at that time already 10,000 Egyptian objects, so it's a big difference. So, um, for a long time, Egypt didn't play an important role in the museum until this gentleman in the middle became director of the museum. His name is Karl Kuttmann, and he was an, the first Egyptologist to be director of the museum, and he succeeded in 1935 to buy a big portion of a very famous private collection. 
and um, the private collection is the one of the gentleman you see here on the very left. It's a photograph of all the collaborators who uh, worked with the Catalogue General at the um, Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And after studying Egyptology, this gentleman on the left, uh, it was his first job to work on this Catalogue General. His name is Friedrich Wilhelm Freiherr von Bissing. So you see the name underneath. The other people are Quibel, um, Chassina, Reisner, and on the right again, the German Egyptologist Ludwig Borchardt. You see them here again, and von Bissing is up on the top. He, we now know it for sure, he had the biggest private collection of Egyptian art ever. For the, f um, even into the future, because we now know he had something approximately 9,000 Egyptian objects. And um, uh, so this was indeed a very big collection. By the way, this uh, Freiherr von Bissing, he is um, the, the grandson of this lady, and this lady is Mathilde Wesendonk. And this is a lady whom Richard Wagner, this famous German componist, um, um, met in Zurich, and um, he, again, fall madly in love with Mathilde Wesendonk, but she was unfortunately already married to Otto, von, uh, Otto Wesendonk, so there was no chance for this love either. However, he, Wagner, immortalized um, Mathilde uh, in the role of Isolde in the opera Tristan and Isolde. And Wagner set five poems of Mathilde Wesendonk into music, which are the Wesendonk leader. So she is definitely immortalized uh, in world music, and this is why my museum is not only connected to world literature, but also to world music, thanks to Mathilde Wesendonk being the grandmother of Friedrich Wilhelm von Bissing, whom you see here with parts of his collection. There's a nice painting of him, and his love for Egyptian art is uh, shown by dating his age in Egyptian hieroglyphs on the painting. He is 65, for those who don't read hieroglyphs, and there's a background picture in Egyptian, and in his hand, he's holding a bronze statuette of the goddess Sachmet. There are still objects of his collection around, and I was recently happy to have a foundation acquire this object, which I identified by the inventory number, to come from the Bissing collection. And it is um, a really important object because it's the only um, Sippus of Horus, which I know of, um, made from uh, ceramics, from clay, burned clay. So suddenly, after buying 2,000 objects from the collection of von Bissing, um, the Egyptian collection in Hanover indeed became very important. Unfortunately, um, soon afterwards we had the Second World War, and um, we are very lucky that most of the objects which came to Hanover in 1935 um, were not inventoried by the director because he thought that would take too much time, but they have, most of them have been photographed. And this is a great blessing because unfortunately the Egyptian collection after World War II, not during, after World War II, uh, had a great loss of one third of the objects. And this didn't happen, as it says on this inventory card. You see, durch Feindeinwirkung vernichtet, so destroyed by action of enemy, because um, most objects which we lost were um, due to the fact that they were stored in salt mines, which were, after the war, plundered. So there's actually a great hope that we get these objects 
that, that we find them maybe one day. By the way, this is very sad that this object has not been photographed. It's a pearl, a glass pearl, bearing the name of Queen Hatshepsut. So it um, would be a very important object from glass because um, glass was only invented shortly before the time of Queen Hatshepsut. But uh, sh soon afterward, in Egypt, it was already brought to an absolute uh, climax of glass production, and we are happy to still have this object from the Kessner collection at our museum, which you can see bears the name of a pharaoh on the shoulder, which is Amenhotep II, and he is a very important pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There was recently a wonderful exhibition on this pharaoh uh, organized by Christian Orsenigo in Budapest, and I was very happy to lend this object to Budapest, although it's priceless, because it is, thanks to the dating, it is the oldest statue in glass of mankind. You have glass objects which are older, like pearls or little plaques, but statuettes you don't, so it's the oldest statuette of glass we have from in, in the world, and it's in Hanover. Actually, I did an exhibition on the losses which we had during the war, which was actually a challenge, because how do you do an exhibition on objects which aren't there anymore? So I decorated the exhibition hall with the inventory cards of the lost objects, as you see here, and I even had the design of a photo which shows the destroyed city of Hanover, because it was really badly destroyed in the war. And if you went closer to this photo of the destroyed city of Hanover, you would see that, getting even closer, that there are holes in the photo. I don't know if you see the holes, but if we get closer, you see the holes now. And if you would have looked through the holes, you would have seen photos of the vanished objects, so photos of the objects which aren't there anymore. As I said, they were plundered in salt mines 100, 100 kilometers to the east of Hanover, where, for example, also the painting gallery of, uh, of Berlin stored the paintings. And um, actually, the salt mines were then occupied by the American army, but unfortunately, it was not sure if this area of Germany would stay in the hands of the Americans or would be turned over to the hands of the English, to the British. And that happened, but unfortunately there was a short period of only one week, and in this week the salt mines were plundered by the people who worked in them um, during the war. So it was a major task um, for the first Egyptologist director um, of the museum after the war to re-establish the Egyptian collection and to fill the gaps. And for example, this is the first lady director of our, and first and la until now last lady director of our museum, uh, Irmgard Woldering. And, <clears throat> and she, for example, bought this very small but very beautiful uh, statuette of um, King Amenhotep III of the 18th dynasty, and um, which also bears his name. So you remember the beautiful building in which the um, museum was housed, and you see on this photo it has a backside, and um, there you see the backside again. Luckily, it was only this backside of the museum which was destroyed in the war, as you can see in the front of the photo here and here. So it was very easy to just lock off this destroyed part and reopen the museum, which was already happening in 1947. However, it seems that the city of Hanover thought that this, this building is not very beautiful 
it's fairly ugly. So they decided to build between 1958 and 1961 a new building around the old building. And now this horrible building looks like this. So inside is the old museum, as you can see here on a wonderful cartoon. And already the new building is a classified monument. So for example, the beautiful lamps you see here, we can't change them. We have to keep them. Wherever they are still there, we have to keep them. So this is the Egyptian collection after um, the war. And this is the current museum with a facade of the old museum inside the museum. And you would see on the ground floor level, when the photo was taken, we had our department of applied arts from the medieval till today. And um, now, nowadays, actually, the ground floor is only for special exhibitions. And on the first floor, we had two of our four departments, um, ancient, uh, uh, ancient cultures, which, would you which you find on the galleries, and ancient Egypt in the, um, behind the old facade. By the way, our fourth department is the largest department in the museum. It's um, numismatics, so coins and medals, because we have over uh, 210,000 coins and medals. So this is the second biggest collection of coins and medals in northern Germany. So this is the Egyptian collection as it was built, redesigned in the 1970s. Uh, you see it here, because a storage area has been built on top, and this is, you must imagine, this is the room which before looked like this. And it was cut into two by putting an um, intermediary ceiling. So above we have our storage area, and below we have our Egyptian department. So, um, how much time? Ten minutes, okay, perfect. So what I would now like to introduce you to, because our museum is very active in special exhibits, and I show you some which we did recently. My first one when I started to work at the museum in 2004 was a photograph exhibition of photographs of Maxime Ducamp, who was accompanied by this first photograph exhibition in the world, which was led to, which went to Egypt by the famous French writer Gustave Flaubert. And then the next year we had um, the um, our biggest German uh, 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 meeting of the Protestant church. So I contributed with an exhibition on Coptic art because we have actually a very nice Coptic uh, um, collection with some 400 Coptic textiles. So it's a fairly important um, uh, part of the museum. <coughs> Together with the museum in Basel in Switzerland, I did this exhibition around a replica of the tomb of Tutmosis III, which we showed in Edinburgh and in Basel, but unfortunately not in Hanover. For a large meeting of German Egyptologists or Egyptology of the German-speaking world in 2006 in Hildesheim and Hanover, I did an exhibition uh, about the contribution of Hanover to the rediscovery of ancient Egypt. And the gentleman you see on the poster is actually Uvo Hölscher, who is a famous um, architect or architectural historian. And his greatest work he did was to excavate the temple of Medinet Habu for the University of Chicago. So he worked for 10 years, he worked for the University of Chicago in Egypt until he couldn't continue due to World War II, but he did all the publication afterwards. So this is a little view into this exhibition, which the big plans, because his observations at this exhibition were absolutely masterful, and again, um, uh, things of this exhibition. So a, a bit connected at least to the Italian language was 
my next exhibition, which I did to, again together with the Antique Museum in Basel, because it was a private collection of uh, Achille Groppi, um, who was um, from Lugano in Switzerland, and um, he had the most famous coffee house in Cairo. It still exists, but it's not as good anymore as it used to be, uh, because after the revolution in Egypt, the family left Egypt and brought a private collection with them, and we displayed that one in Hanover and in Basel. And this is a wonderful view into the exhibition, which was also then focusing on the coffee house and um, the beautiful small objects Achille Groppi um, uh, used to collect. And it was great fun to have the small mosaic glass you see on the right, which is just this large, blown up to three meters on the photo left, and it still works, it's wonderful. My next exhibition I did on the Egyptian garden, and this time it was the first exhibition on the Egyptian garden, and I think in the meantime there have been five others. So apparently it was a good idea to do an exhibition on the Egyptian garden, which you see here with models of Egyptian gardens, uh, like the one of Tel Dabba, which the Austrian colleagues so meticulously excavated. Um, so you have a view into this garden exhibition, and um, that's the beginning, and this is a catalog. Um, I myself have worked for two years for the University of Chicago at Chicago House in Luxor, and a colleague of mine, she started at the same time as I did, but continues to be there, and um, she um, was uh, one of the draftsperson to document the most important uh, 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 um, discovery in the Valley of the Kings after the tomb of Tutankhamun. And you know that Tutankhamun's tomb is number 62 in the Valley of the Kings, and then there was one discovered which is um, 63, so this is the catalog, and this is a view into this tomb, and it was evident that you needed a very, very good draftsman to document this um, um, find, uh, which is in catastrophic state. And this is my colleague Susan Osgood from Vermont in the States, uh, who still works at Chicago House, and she was then engaged to document these finds, which she did in wonderful drawings. And this is then what we uh, what we exhibited, this is by the way, uh, um, a coffin lid she drew one to one. So this is the exhibition saying between 1922 and 2006 there has no other tomb been discovered in the Valley of the Kings. And so this is the entrance to the exhibition. And it was nice to just show objects which came from the Valley of the Kings, for example, this one is an object which nobody else but Howard Carter excavated in the year 1900 in the tomb 42 at the Valley of the Kings, so a canopic jar by the royal nurse Senat Nye, which is in my museum. And in this wall, which shows a portion of the tomb of Seti I in the Valley of the Kings, you can even see a fragment, which I have in my museum, from the collection of Kestner. And you know, the tomb has been discovered in 1822, so um, it quickly came to Rome, this fragment, and um, I, it's in the collection of Kestner, and I tried to position it in the tomb of Seti I, and if you now look very carefully, you can see where it jumps in. There are two possibility positions, so I, don't, I haven't decided yet which one, so there are the two, and you see one of our guardians showing this portion of the, ex uh, of the tomb fragment. Then there was documentation on uh, in Egyptology in general, and there was yet another fragment 
to identify because um, this drawing you see on the wall is from a publication of um, the University of Chicago. And um, actually I discovered when I came to the Museum August Kestner that um, it is part from this tomb. It is a small object you see in the showcase on the left, this one, and it actually shows two faces of two princesses from a part of the tomb which is very badly destroyed. This part, this is how it looks like today, and the drawing of Chicago House of the University of Chicago makes it much clearer. And if you again look carefully where the fragment jumps in, so you see this is a fragment from the tomb in my museum. And Susan did wonderful drawings of other discoveries in Luxor, and this is a head of Tutmosis III, and from the collection of von Bissing, I have also one of Tutmosis III in Hanover, which is a beautiful piece. Unfortunately, as you see, the face is kind of damaged, so I allowed myself, but this is totally illegal, to have our photographer to um, mirror the better preserved part, so you can see it would have been a really nice head of Tutmosis. The third. So we also showed art of Susan Osgood. And a wonderful exhibition which was traveling was one on my bronze collection, and I will finish with this one, um, which is um, the bronze collection of Hanover, which was also shown in the Egyptian Museum in Bonn, in Leipzig, and Gotha. You see, I showed all the bronzes of my museum in a fairly tentative exhibition with a lot of fire going on. So I wanted to jump to two more minutes. Two. <laughs> okay, so um, I do things very quickly. We, we, oh, by the way, in this exhibition we also showed Egyptian objects from the collection of Goethe, which you see in the case on the left, because he had also Egyptian bronzes, which we then showed um, at this exhibition. We did one on color, which was fun to organize things just in color, also redesigning my exhibition. We did a fashion exhibition, which was a lot of fun, because the Baroque fashion, which students designed, were then shown, and we are close to the city of fashion in Italy, aren't we? So we had a catwalk built into our museum, and um, we had a wonderful fashion show of Baroque designed fashion at the museum, and that's the advantage when you have more collections. And we did a, an exhibition on restaurants, or the history of restaurants, which was fun too, because um, in Egypt you don't have restaurants, but you have canteens for workmen. So it was very funny to start this exhibition um, uh, uh, with um, Egypt. And my last exhibition, which only closed um, uh, um, two weeks ago, was one on the demon god Bees, which I did, which was my first international cooperation uh, with two other museums, the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam and the uh, Karl, uh, Nie Karlsberg Glyptothek in Copenhagen, and that was on the demon god Bees, which was a very fun exhibition to do because he's a god for the families and he is worshipped in private houses. So he's very much attached to the normal, to the private people of Egypt and not the kings and gods and so on. So it was great fun. We even reconstructed a birth bed with design of bees. So you see it was a lot of fun to do this exhibition. For my museum it was also the first time to do a family exhibition. And uh, when it comes to bees being the god, of um, music, dance, and you know, alcoholic drinks. We had a disco ball on, at the exhibition. And then very provocatively, we called also a section to base to be the sex god. And since he's the god of birth, he's also the god of you know, creating what brings birth. So we had this very shy part of the exhibition and um, we uh, recommended that you open the curtain 
um, and then you saw horrible things like this. Um, and this is a masterpiece on the left from the Allard Pierce Museum in Amsterdam. And then there's Bays and the rest of the world. So we also talked about finds of Bays uh, at the um, at the um, uh, in the Mediterranean world. And the last photo to show is that we also are active in congresses, and this is a congress of CPEC. CPEC is the Egyptological part of ICOM. It's the Comité International d'Egyptologie, and it's part of ICOM, and we did a wonderful meeting together with the colleagues in Hildesheim in 2000. Eight. So you see we are trying to be also very active in international activities. And for this reason, I'm very happy that I had the chance in one of those days where Crema is the beating heart of Italian Egyptology to be present and show you um, my museum, which has so much to do with Italy and it wouldn't exist without um, the city of Rome and Italy altogether. So thank you very, very much for your attention and I wish a great success to this Congress and maybe other things. Thank you. <laughs>